the material we've been covering in this leading for a change section. This is what um, is our what we call our BHG framework. And I'll explain to you what BHG stands for at the end. Um, and we offer, uh, actually, you're getting an excerpt from what amounts to, a, we spend a two days, we have a two-day class that covers nothing but that framework. And that's frankly what we're going to spend the rest of our time on. All right? So now, with that, so we've talked about organizing around product. We talk about what are the decisions you got to make in order to, because the whole Agile thing is based on delivering the greatest business value to the customer, right? Well, how do you decide? Well, you've got you to make some decisions about your organization. What kind of organization you want to be? What are the kind of customers you want to attract or market to, right? So we've talked about that. Now we're going to get to talk about restructuring, transforming the organization. And to get started on that, I'm going to introduce you to a guy called William Passmore. Uh, written a number of books. Uh, the one I would point to is Sociotechnical Organizational Design. He made a couple of, uh, here's the gold that I got out of this. So, this is your organization. And remember my generic term, definition for organization. I don't care where you are, what kind, how big, what size, what kind, what you do, where you are. Okay, they're all the same. It's a permeable border. Okay, and every organization takes some inputs and through some chain of value adding steps creates outputs. If your customers find those useful, you will prosper. If your customers do not, you will decay and decline. And that's otherwise referred to as your value stream. Now what's interesting about that is he was talking about this before Michael Porter, which I thought was kind of cool. So I thought, well, that's interesting. Then he went on to say that that, that value chain is really a composite of two systems, two organizational systems. The first one is your technical system. How you tech, so I'm not talking about technology. I'm talking about technical, how do you technically do your work? You insert tab A into slot B to produce widget Q. That's how you do it. Or what we, what we would call as processes, whether they're manufacturing processes, business processes, it's your processes. The other um, system is your social system. How do you socially govern the conduct of that work? There are formal ways, there are informal ways. This is your culture, what we would call your culture. Oh, well, that's interesting. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Then he went on to say, point out that when a change is made to one system, a change must necessarily be made to the other system. Otherwise, your organization will reject that change just like the body rejects a transplanted organ. That's my language. Let me give you some examples. How many people remember when empowerment was all the fad? Those of us who've been around a while, right? Everybody understand what empowerment is? Empowerment is moving decision making to as close to as where a problem occurs or at least where it's observed as possible. Right? If you are interested in process speed, right, the first step you take is analyze your processes and remove as many interruptions as you can. You want, your goal is an interruption-free process. Now, an objective analysis of most processes will reveal, and it still does today, that the majority of interruptions are done in the name of managerial control. This is where empowerment came in. Originally, empower, the need for empowerment, before it became faddish and everybody wanted to do it just because it was altruistic, it was the social system construct of empowerment was driven by the technical system construct of process speed. We want to speed up our processes. To do that, we need to move decision making to as close to as where a problem is, is, uh, occurs, or at least where it's first observed, as possible. So on a manufacturing line, for example, that would mean decision rather than escalating them up the management chain, that means probably training a senior operator to make that call. Okay? There's an input. If you make a change to one system, you must necessarily make a change to the other, else the organization will reject your change or ignore it, like the body tries to reject a transplanted organ. Too many organizations don't understand that interdependence. They will 
pile change upon change to how they technically do their work with absolutely zero consideration or lip service at best as to what the cultural implications are. This is what leads us to our definition of organizational agility. We define organizational agility as the product of process agility, your the agility of your technical system, times cultural agility, the agility of your social system. The multiplication sign is there for three reasons. One, it reminds us that there's a difference between what's technically possible and what's culturally doable. Two, it reminds us that the two are interdependent. And three, it reminds us that anything times zero is zero. So that's our definition of organizational agility. Now, so we're going to focus on culture because it's the key. But if we're going to talk about culture, we need to define it. Let me introduce you to Larry Miller. Larry Miller is a colleague. I draw on him a lot. I met him in the 80s. He's one of the most pragmatic organizational change leaders. His first organizational change effort was a uh, men's prison in North Carolina for the North Carolina Department of Corrections. Hard. Okay, high stress, right? Very pragmatic guy. If you try and define culture, if you go look in Wikipedia or, or any dictionary or whatever, you'll, it's, it's pointless. You'll, it's highly recursive. You feel like a dog chasing its tail. Larry's got one of the best pragmatic definitions of culture. He defines culture as the sum of an organization's habits. What's that mean? Three types of behavior, human behavior. First is emotional behavior. Everybody has triggers, right? Road rage is an emotional behavior, right? But it all could also be laughter, right? Emotional behavior. Second one is intentional behavior. These are the things you make on lists for yourself, to-do lists for yourself, or these are the MBOs you get from your boss. These are the things you intend to do. The third is habitual behavior. When I start my work day, I go into my office, I fire up my email to see if there's anything hot that came in overnight, maybe from Europe or the Far East, or is there something hanging fire? If there's not, I then go get myself caffeine. No one has to write me a list to remind me to do those things. No one has to incent me to do those things. You may rely on the fact that those things will get done. The fact is there is tremendous competitive advantage in habitual behavior because it is highly reliable and requires next to no management. So your job as a leader is to craft the organizational behaviors, the, the habitual, create the habitual behaviors that lead to agility. So let's talk about habits. Everybody know this guy, Stephen Covey? Okay, I had the good fortune to be able to work pretty much directly with Stephen in the mid 80s. He hadn't gotten his seed money from HP yet. He had written Principle Centered Leadership, was working on seven habits. Fascinating guy. Anyway, he defined habit as the intersection of three things. Knowledge, knowing what to do. Skill, knowing how to do it. And attitude, knowing why to do it. Gives you the impetus to act. Where they intersect? is where you get habit. The stronger the intersection, the stronger the habit. The looser the intersection, the looser the habit. You are a customer service agent. On the phone, it's Friday, it's five o'clock. You're dealing with a customer, giving you a lot of displaced anger. You know what to do. You know how to do it, but you just don't care anymore. You have enjoyed all you can stand. You don't have habit. You may be the parent of a child with a chemical abuse problem. You may know that something must be done. You may desperately want to do it, but you don't know how. You don't have habit. By the way, this is a, also a model I use in diagnosing organizational performance problems. So an organizational performance problem rises up. Is it a process problem? Is it a, is the, did we come up with a, with a with something for which our process wasn't designed to break it process? Is it a technology problem? Server broke. You know, I don't know. Or is it a people problem? 
If we get down to where it's a people problem, I ask, is it a knowledge problem, a skill problem, or an attitude problem? If it's a knowledge problem or a skill problem, well, I can fix that with training. Attitude problems you cannot fix with training. You will only make them worse. Don't bother to try and train an attitude problem. Surely you've got to do your due diligence to see is it problems at home, is there something else you know, affecting the situation. But if not, the answer to an attitude problem is a shape up or ship out message. Hopefully delivered in a way that will optimize the chances that they'll choose to shape up. Never try to train. You got somebody who's bad mouth in the organization, you know, you got a communication problem. We're gonna send you to effective communications class. You know what you get back? A silver tongue devil. Don't bother, don't waste your time or money or their time. Okay, so we've talked about behavior. We've talked about the interdependence of a process and culture. We're focusing on culture. We define what culture is, some of an organization's habits. We talked about, about uh, habitual behaviors and why they provide competitive advantage. We talked about behavior or habits being the composite of knowledge, skill, and attitude. <clears throat> now let's talk about, um, switch topics a little bit. We talked about conditioning the cultural soil. So how do you test for cultural fertility, cultural toxicity towards the change. For this, I'm gonna introduce you to a guy named Kurt Lewin. He was the one who came when you talk about the, the things of, of, of change, where you change, freeze, and then unfreeze, you know, remember those three states, anyway. Um, he was called upon by, by Franklin Roosevelt during World War II. Roosevelt said, I'm going to have to ration gas, I'm going to have to ration meat, I'm going to have to ration a bunch of stuff, American public's not going to like it, how do, I, how do I, I get them to be okay with it? And so he, he's the one who helped them do that. And I'm going to introduce you, I don't know what he called it, but I'm going to introduce you to something that I call the Lewin Force Field Model. Okay? So, you've got your current state, your culture is currently here. You want it to be here. Your culture is where it is. It's in its current state because there's an equilibrium between forces that are driving change and forces that are restraining change. Now, if you want to move the current state line up to the desired state line, to which of those two forces, driving forces or restraining forces, to which of those two forces should you give your energy first? Restraining. You're restraining. What do most managers and leaders do? All right, they add more driving forces. Here's the, here's the deal. Restraining forces are almost always qualitative. Questions of feeling. Driving forces are almost always quantitative. I, I chose to sit through a six hour lecture on gestalt psychotherapy thinking it would be interesting. <laughs> I was wrong. But there was one nugget. Never confront irrationality with rationality because you only serve to exacerbate the irrationality. Never throw facts at feelings. Anybody who's in a relationship should understand this. Never throw facts at feelings. You do not counter restraining forces by adding more driving forces. Often, all they have to do is be listened to and felt like they've been heard and understood. They don't even have to be agreed with. And the restraining force will die birthing. Ignore it and it'll struggle for life. And here's what happens. You can add more driving forces and you can push that current state. But those restraining forces, they don't go away. They take all that energy and it coils up like a spring. And eventually that compressed energy releases and it can drive you back, probably in a position worse than where you were before. Because here's the rule. Unexpressed feelings never die. They are only buried alive to rise up again in ugly or unpredictable ways. Let me say that again because I like it. Unexpressed feelings never die. They are only buried alive to rise up again in ugly or unpredictable ways. Again, anybody in a relationship should know that. Your first energy, it's like if you're on, you're on the street in your car and you've got one foot on the gas, one foot on the brake, and you want to go faster. 
First foot you move, one on the brake. So you've got all that. Where do you start? We've now, we now know how the culture, is it fertile, is it toxic? What is it, where do we start? We wanna start this change effort. So let me, I'm gonna introduce you to a couple other people. This is Captain David Marquet. He was the commander of a nuclear, fast attack nuclear submarine. High stress environment. They were the worst in the fleet on almost every dimension. Performance, officer retention, just about every. And they gave it to him and he turned it around. And it's a real rags to riches story. He wrote about it. He's retired now. He wrote a book called Turn the Ship Around. Pretty interesting. Anyway. He said, when you're trying to change employees' behaviors, you have two approaches from which to choose. Change people's thinking and hope this leads to new behavior, or change people's behavior and hope this leads to new thinking. You want the latter. Change your behaviors, let the thinking follow. Too often we approach these, we gotta convince these people first and then they'll behave this way. Forget that. Just start demanding different behavior. They'll, if they're smart people, they'll, ask, they'll either figure it out or they'll ask. Too often we start off on the wrong foot by trying to convince them. Don't bother. Said more directly, John Shook, kind of regarded as the father of the lean manufacturing movement. Um, back in the 80s when the Japanese auto manufacturers had decided that they wanted to get involved, do offshore manufacturing, meaning they wanted to build manufacturing uh, facilities in the U.S., Honda went Greenfield, they built a plant in Marysville, Ohio. Toyota joined and in, entered into a joint agreement with uh, General Motors. Uh, General Motors had closed their plant in Fremont, California two years before. It was the worst performing plant in their system. Uh, heavy UAW presence. They had think quality problems. People with a car who received a car that was built at Fremont would find like beer bottles behind the door panels, right? And stuff, it was just terrible. And GM finally just closed the whole thing down. Well, with Toyota, they, just, they went into this, they created the new United Motor Manufacturing Inc., NUMI. And John Shook from Toyota was the one who was tasked, given the task of introducing the Toyota way to a group of UAW employees. They, surprisingly, they made the management decision to bring back the UAW. It was a pretty, it, it stayed around. They, 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 it was a great success until 2008 with the recession, right? Now that plant is owned by Tesla and that's where they do their manufacturing. Anyway, John Shook said, the way to change a culture is not to start by changing people's minds, instead start by changing how they behave. It doesn't get more direct than that. So the first step where you wanna begin is define the behaviors you want to see. If you cannot define your change in terms of behaviors, then I don't know how you're going to use any of the tools for leading or managing change. I do not know what, how you're going to teach. I do not know how you're going to coach. I do not know what you're going to measure. I don't know what you're going to, how you're going to reward or, or correct when, when you get the results of your measures. I don't know how you're going to do any of that stuff. You have to define, this is hard, but this is leadership stuff, right? But here's an exercise. Put yourself, say, three years out. Your change effort has been an amazing success. What behaviors are you seeing more of? What behaviors are you seeing less of? Here's a, I'm gonna give you a, uh, an anonymous, in real life example. Customer service. Customer service is not giving the customer whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want, because they want it. That is indentured servitude. Right. So what do companies do? They'll say, well, they, come, they, they say, we want it, we're gonna measure it, we want total customer satisfaction. They're in this meeting, they're all talking, about it. and then this game of one ups when wordsmithing goes on. No, 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 total customer satisfaction is not gonna, we want total customer satisfaction, right? No, 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 that's not, we want customer delight. No, we want customer ecstasy. Somewhere down the line is a customer orgasm, I am sure. But we'll stay away from, we'll stay from. None of that is helpful, right? None of that is helpful. Here's, 
Because what would you do otherwise? Total customer, as what, opposed to occasional customer satisfaction? Total quality as opposed to what, occasional quality? You know? Who's going to disagree with any of that? So how are you going to measure any of that stuff? You're going to send out surveys? Because people don't get surveyed enough, do they? Zero help. Here's a real life solution to that. And we define, this person defined customer service in this way. They don't expect us to be perfect. They'll put up with it, but what they want is for us to care. So in that spirit, we will exhibit these behaviors. And you can read those for yourself. I can measure those. I can coach those. I can train those. So looking for a starter set of uh, behaviors in order to create an agile organization? You are in luck. <laughs> because the Agile Manifesto, if you remember it, is almost entirely behavior based. Facilitating change is better than trying to predict it. We base our decisions on empiricism, which require transparency, inspection and adaptation, mutual trust and respect, collaboration, the principles. Highest priority is satisfy the customer through continue. Are you delivering continuously? I can measure that. Welcome changing requirements. Are you resisting changing requirements? Or are you welcoming them? I can observe that. Business people and product developers work together daily. I can observe that. Almost every one of these things is observable. Not all of them, but almost every one of these are observable. And you remember the trade-offs. Are you making the trade-offs this way? Or not? These, I want, these are the behaviors I want. Okay, so you have to define the behaviors. So now how do you turn those behaviors into habits? You cannot work on habits directly. Just, so when you want, it's just like exercising the heart. You cannot exercise the heart directly. The way you exercise the heart is by exercising the large muscles. Running. Closest thing we got to a miracle drug. Running. That in turn puts more demand on the heart, makes the heart work faster, harder. Thus, you are exercising the heart, but it's not directly. So what are the big muscles in a culture? What are the things that are the influences on behaviors to make them habitual? Well, for this, I found a thing. At the time, it was called the 7S model. It was a book called The Art of Japanese Management by Tony Athos and Dick Pascal. Different consultants have put their thumbprint on it. We're now up to 10S. I don't know who did what. But it depicts the organization as a holistic ecosystem with permeable borders. That's good. It is a people model, not a business model. Nowhere on here will you see capital, land, you know, or things like that, property like that. And again, it applies to organizations of any kind, any size, any function, any place in the hierarchy. We're going to walk through this. So running exercises the heart. How you configure, how you calibrate the variables that are the 10S diagram, that's how you're going to affect habits. So let's walk through that. At the center is shared vision and values. Now, how many people want to have just throw up in their mouth when they hear shared vision and values? It usually generates an adverse biological reaction. <laughs> and rightfully so, because most of them are junk. They are mockable fluff. They talk about total customer satisfaction, right? As opposed to occasional <laughs> customer satisfaction. Who's going to be against those things? Right? A good, I'll talk a little bit more about the biggest mistakes. The characteristic of shared vision and values is that one of the, the hallmark is that they are essentially changeless. This is, this is what you believe. And it's not just one document. It's a, it can often be a body of work. If you look at, a, at, the, at the US, yeah, we've got the Constitution. Do we not also have the Declaration of Independence? Do we not also have the Gettysburg Address? Do we not have every presidential inauguration and farewell address? Do we not have every Supreme Court decision? We've got a ton of stuff that creates our vision and values for this country. And it is essentially changes. We've been around for what, 240 years, something like that, 230 years? 27 amendments, 10 of them represent the uh, Bill of Rights that were passed immediately. Two of them were implementing one and then repealing it. 15 changes in 240 years. 
essentially changeless. The problems with these, with what I see in most companies, is is if they're mockable, mockable fluff, it's because they're way too high. They're fluff. Definite, my definition, a, a good vision value statement is one that is written with enough specificity that a reasonable person could nobly disagree with it. If it's written at too high a level, it is fluff. If it is written with enough specificity that a reasonable person could nobly disagree with it, now we're talking. Another problem that I see with most of these things is that it's not that they don't have a mission and vision and value statement, it's that they got two. The one that they publish on their website and post on a plaque in the lobby, and the one by which they really operate. And now you got an organizational integrity problem. They need to be the same. Symbols. Symbols are the manifestation, the physical manifestation of your operational, not necessarily the professed, but the operational vision and values. Every job is important, equally important. I got reserved parking. Big office, little office. Fancy furniture, navy gray metal desks. All right, there's, I'm not saying one symbol's good as, an, you know, not bad, but symbols tell you a lot about what's going on in the culture. I had, the, there was this one engagement, was talking to the manager, he was talking about getting rid of a whole layer of management. I said, well, you know, you got reserved parking and lots, why don't we get rid of that, right? And you would thought I'd blasphemed, right? He had a fit. He was ready to get, throw, you know, all kinds of people overboard, but mess with the parking. <laughs> Some people are having their management meetings in five-star hotels. Others are having them at the Days Inn by the airport. Some people fly first class. Some people fly coach. They're all symbols. Symbols give you cultural insights. Another favorite question when I go into a new client, tell me who your heroes are. Who are the heroes at this company? They give you, the, the names of their heroes are people of the past. I know I'm, t I'm in a culture that is in a state of decline. If the names they give me are heroes of the present, I know that I'm talking to a culture, I'm talking to a company with, whose culture is in growth, expansion. How do you become a hero? You take risks. If you're in decline, you don't take risks. Right? So, they provide cultural insights and they can be changed. This guy, when he had this panic about the, uh, the parking lot, that showed you how important that symbol was, which is, I'd say, is all the more reason to change it. Streams, those are the things that are outside your organization over which you have no control. I would have said market forces, exogenous factors, or something like that, but none of those start with an S. Streams, those things that are outside your control. A hallmark of streams is that they are constantly changing. And by the way, they can affect you anywhere around this. These are the things that test your organization's agility. How do you respond to that change? The reason I'm connecting it to strategy is because strategy is how you are gonna deal with the constantly changing streams in a way which you still stay true to your essentially changeless vision and values. And you remember early on, we talked about the difference between strategic planning in a static world and strategic planning in a dynamic world. Strategy is how do you deal with the constantly changing streams in a way that is congruent with your essentially changeless vision and values. And the three of them will often be talked about together and referred to as the strategic path. Just something to know. Structure, organization work, definition, roles, and functions. When we talked about scaling, we talked about how this changes in an agile environment. Systems. By systems, I do not mean um, computer systems, let's say. I mean the systems you use to communicate, the systems you use to make decisions. Chief among these are measurement systems. And I mentioned before that the thing that can provide um, the greatest thrust or the greatest drag to your change effort are the things you choose to measure and thus reward and how well you did that. What, here, let me give you an example. In Agile, how many people measure utilization? Now, at all. 
That's a big factor for a lot of places. It's a stupid measure. Don't measure utilization. You don't care about utilization. How many people have to drive on an interstate to get home? Right. Traffic engineers have a term, it's called saturation. That identifies the number of vehicles that can be on the road while it's still maintaining posted speeds. Your freeway ride home during rush hour, are you moving at posted speeds? <laughs> no, you're beyond. The reason they had the lights, this is queuing theory, the reason they had the lights at the end of the, the, the on-ramps is to adjust the, the inflow. And it, it works until it gets overwhelmed. Right? But you know, if I added more vehicles, I would increase the utilization of that investment. What's that do to your trip? Your throughput now sucks. Throughput I care about. Utilization I don't care about. You want to measure? We talk about frequent rapid delivery. Measure actual time versus elapsed time from beginning to end. That'll tell you something. Systems. Style. Basically two types of management style, and I'm talking about management style here. And there's two styles that bookend. There's command and control, commitment and release. One's, it's not that one's good or bad. Command and control came out of, it's, it promotes conformity. Successful operations in times of crisis, the military, right? That's where it came from. And even they are moving away from some of this. But say, say this room was to catch on fire. Now, I guess I'm conducting this class, so um, I'm in command here. So I say, you know what? Let's uh, I'd like you to gather up in, in small groups, talk about different ways that we could get out of here, uh, exit, uh, how you feel about those different ways, and then come back to me. A stupid idea? It's a pretty stupid idea. Better yet, that somebody who knows the hotel stands up in a loud, clear voice and says, everybody this way at double time. You cannot walk, you'll trip the person in back of you. You cannot run, you'll screw up the person in front of you. Everybody, double time, this way. Command and control promotes conformity, which you want often in times of crisis. Commitment and, and release promotes creativity, which is what you want most of the other time. Skills. The skills require, there's two basic types of skills, general skills. What does everyone need to know to be a good citizen in this organization? This is how we arrange a meeting. This is how we conduct a meeting. This is how we communicate. This is how decisions are made. This is, you know, we do this and we don't do that, that sort of thing. Then there are specialist skills. These are the skills you need to know to be a product owner. These are the skills you need to know to be a scrum master. These are the skills to be a development team member on this team. General skills, specialist skills. Staff, that's pretty self-evident. You've got several kinds. You've got employees, that's the, the members of your talent pool with whom you have a mutual long-term commitment. Then you have consultants and contractors who are the members of your talent pool with whom you have a mutual short-term commitment. And now I'm gonna get on my soapbox. Humans are not resources. This table is a resource. My laptop is a resource. This room is a resource. You people are humans. You are not resources. Who knows when the first use of the word resource in relation to a human was made? Slavery. And that should tell you everything you need to know to never do that again. I think every human resources department should change their name to some, the personnel would be just fine. Just don't ever do that again. And then finally there is yourself as a member of the staff. These are the variables, these are the levers, the dials you have that you can play with to affect which behaviors become habitual.